Welcome to the Caregiver Toolbox Dementia Series. Today's program is Managing Common Challenging Behaviors. My name is Lynn Dobb, and I'm a social worker here at the Central Ohio Area Agency on Aging. And with me is... I'm Paula Tolliver, and I'm also a social worker at the Central Ohio Area Agency on Aging. And Lynn and I both facilitate a caregiver support group, which the Area Agency on Aging hosts every Monday morning. It's a virtual group from 10 to 1130. So today we thought we would talk about some common challenging behaviors that caregivers often encounter and kind of some um, techniques and tools for managing those and making them less invasive in the day. Um, we're going to talk about hallucinations and delusions. We're going to talk about wandering. We're going to talk about bathing, showering, cleanliness, toileting challenges, uh, the sleep-wake cycle, people getting enough sleep, and then eating and drinking. So first of all, we're going to start with hallucinations and delusions. Um, these are very, very common as the brain deteriorates, as the brain um, starts to really misinterpret the world, which is what's kind of happening with hallucinations and delusions. Um, and just to define them, hallucinations refers to seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, feeling things that are not there. So sensing things that are not truly in the environment. Um, and delusions uh, is believing that things that are happening that are not. So it's really common for people with any form of dementia to think maybe they put something away um, and they forget that they put it away and now they think that someone stole it because they can't find it. So it's very common to have kind of this delusional thinking, which is thinking things that are happening. One thing to remember is that delusions and hallucinations are completely real to the person. Sometimes they're scary. And sometimes they're harmless, okay? Sometimes people um, uh, you know, think that someone's coming into the house and stealing, and that can be really scary to them. Um, but sometimes it's something harmless, like um, you know, people dancing and they're not hurting anybody, they're not even bothering the person, the person just kind of refers to them. Um, they can also be based on something real, uh, like shadows, uh, people looking out in the backyard and seeing shadows in the backyard, or noises that the house makes generally that people are misinterpreting or misnaming. And so the, this is very, very common. Uh, one other thing I would say about delus delusions and hallucinations is they do seem to be more common in the afternoons and evenings um, when the brain is more apt to be tired and there's probably more shadows in the environment. So they do tend to be more common. They also are somewhat common at night. So just some suggestions. Um, it, it, and this seems, uh, it, this is very difficult. It's easy to say, but really don't argue with people or reason with people. Um, try to talk them out of the delusion or hallucination. Say, you know, this isn't happening. You're not really seeing it. You're not really hearing it. You know, um, in other words, what, what we sometimes say is go with the flow, you know, or get on the bus and go where it's going. That's kind of a common phrase we say, which is basically thinking that um, it is almost impossible to talk people out or argue with people when they are having a hallucination or a delusion. In fact, all you tend to do is make them mad or angry or more scared or the situation can definitely intensify. So, you know, it is really okay to just go along with people. Um, if they're scared of the bugs, respond to the fact that they're scared, you know, and try and get them uh, to a place where they feel more safe as opposed to, to arguing with them about the fact that there aren't bugs on the ceiling. And, and, and to that end, you can ignore a hallucination that is not causing a problem. You know, sometimes people, or a delusion for that matter. Sometimes people have these beliefs or these, you know, they, they, they say, again, there's little children in the kitchen, but it's not really bothering them. Sometimes you can just ignore that and not worry about that. Um, offer reassurance if they're scared. Sometimes you can even take actions that can alleviate to some extent people's fears. I remember um, covering up a window that was sending in shadows just to kind of you know, 
uh, decrease the shadows and, and not to tell the person that, you know, they're scared, that, that they shouldn't be scared, but just cover that up. Now the shadows aren't coming in and the person is less scared, less apprehensive. Um, it is really important to stay calm. And this is very difficult to do sometimes when people are, people can sometimes accuse you of, you know, having affairs or uh, bringing people into your house. I mean, they can accuse you of lots of things. Um, sometimes it can be helpful to distract people, refocus their attention on music or pictures or uh, something that they're wearing food or drink, all of these can be a very helpful distraction. Uh, and remember that people's behavior are the result of physical changes. So they're not doing this on purpose. They're not doing this, you know, and they really, really do believe that the, that, that whatever is happening is happening to them. Medications can be very, very helpful in this. Um, you have to be super careful because People whose brains are experiencing dementia don't always, uh, first of all, they don't always um, process medicines in the same way as someone who's not. Um, but also they oftentimes need very low doses of any kind of medication and medication can, um, in some people's brains, cause them to have worse reactions. So they need to be monitored very carefully. But I always tell families, um, especially when someone is having a hallucinations and delusions that are scary or upsetting, or they constantly have anxiety about those, it's probably a good idea to talk to the doctor and see what's available to kind of see if we can, they typically are not going to go away, but they can calm down and become less scary to people. The next behavior that we want to address is wandering. And oftentimes we will raise this um, to our support group or to anyone that we're talking with and ask if their loved one has wandered out of the house. Um, and they say, oh, no, 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 that's not a problem. And what the truth is, it's not a problem until it's a problem. We don't often think that um, somebody's going to wander, but it can and it does happen with some frequency. People with um, all forms of dementia can get lost. Um, they can get lost in places that they previously knew very well. They can get lost within their own home, um, not being able to find either the restroom or the kitchen um, because they're disoriented. Um, the dementia is taking them out of that familiar place and they no longer recognize it. The very frightening thing um, that can happen is when somebody wanders and gets in their car and then gets lost. Um, Sadly, I've heard all too often of uh, loved ones saying that their um, spouse went to get the car filled up with gas, and then all of a sudden it was an hour, and then it was two hours, and it was, you know, the time was ticking, um, and that's where you know, it, it's a fine line, um, but we want to alert people to be tuned into these potential issues so that if um, at all possible, not having your loved one drive alone, um, if they're continuing to drive or stop driving altogether when they have a dementia diagnosis. We don't know if we're gonna get lost, we can't predict it, but when it happens, then you have to deal with it. Um, so, um, a lot of times people may even just, you know, step outside thinking that they're going to go get the mail. They're going to, I'm going to walk to the mailbox and, or bring in the newspaper or what have you. And just going outside, they can get disoriented. And instead of coming back to the house that they, as we would hope they would, they may start walking down the street. They may, and it has happened, try and go into someone else's home. Um, again, wandering does happen. So be tuned into this and just think um, uh, preventatively as much as you can. So um, not to be a broken record, but 
Um, even if a person has never gotten lost, it's definitely important to plan for that day, that time when they might wander. And that's why we um, strongly encourage people to have some form of ID um, that they're wearing. So there is a medical alert safe return program through the Alzheimer's Association. It gives a, a bracelet um, to someone or um, and it can also be a bracelet for the loved one as well as the care partner um, so that if the um, individual with dementia wanders off and somebody you know, finds them, they will be able to see the medical alert and it's tied into a system that allows them to know where does that person live, who, do, who is the primary contact to get them returned to their um, loved ones. The benefit of having um, a medical alert uh, kind of partner bracelet for the caregiver is that God forbid something should happen to the caregiver, it allows um, safety um, for the individual in dementia. This way, somebody knows that person, the caregiver, is caring for somebody with dementia and will look out for them, make sure that they're not, um, you know, alone if, if something should happen and the caregiver has to be taken from the house. There's also a next of kin registry program. Um, if an individual has a driver's license or state ID, and this is through the Bureau of Motor Vehicles, and you can enroll in that state um, next of kin registry. Um, if they, um, an individual will wear one, um, you can have an emergency response necklace or bracelet, and a, that can notify a central line if they fall or get lost. Um, a lot of those, you know, somebody has to press a button to know that they, you know, are in need of help. Um, but if somebody finds them, again, that emergency response system is linked to a central system. Some of these systems are so sensitive now that they can also measure if somebody um, has fallen and that will trigger an alert and, and someone will come and check on that individual. If your uh, loved one wear, uh, carries a phone, um, there are all kinds of tracking apps um, that can be put on a phone. And if you don't know how to do it, ask your grandchildren or somebody younger than you and they will be able to help you out. So along the lines of preparing, um, some things to consider. Um, putting some kind of, there's a warning bell, chimes, something on the door handles and windows so that if somebody opens the door, there is a auditory alert to the uh, caregiver that the individual is trying to you know, leave the house, go into another room, um, that signal will help. Um, at night, you know, hopefully most of us all lock our doors at night um, and we want to continue to do that. Um, one thing that uh, we have seen being successful is that um, putting a lock higher up on the door out of the line of sight of the person with dementia um, it can just be a slide lock um, because, you know, the individual may still remember how to unlock a door, but they may not have the thought process to look above to realize that there's an additional lock at the top of the door. So be creative um, and um, always know that you can reach out, whether it's the Area Agency on Aging, the Alzheimer's Association, we're always open to talking through individual scenarios and giving tips um, as to how to um, maintain safety within your home. Things like keys, coats, suitcases, pocketbooks, all of those are visual cues that may trigger somebody thinking, oh, I, I got to get to work or, or I have to get to the airport or I have to leave in some way. So you don't want to leave those where those are visible um, because, again, it could trigger um, a wandering incident. It's always nice to have good neighbors and especially so if your loved one does have dementia um, so that they can be on 
really on alert to let you know if they see your loved one outside the house, um, just wandering, or if they're outside the house and they're not dressed um, appropriately, they can really be um, a, a godsend for, for everyone. Um, some communities have emergency responders who can be notified if a person is at risk for wandering. Um, we have the Amber Alerts. We have other um, systems in place if somebody um, wanders and you want to have um, a more global um, response within the community to look out for somebody. But do realize that wandering does happen. Um, and ideally, we don't wait until it happens. You'll be a lot happier if you plan ahead. So the next topic we want to discuss is one which is very, very common. And it's not one of those topics that is very comfortable to discuss also because it involves a very private activity. Most of us aren't going to invite someone into our shower you know, or to help us get clean. It's not something that you know an adult generally would do. So um, bathing, showering, cleanliness. And why do these activities become so challenging for people with dementia? Well, one reason, and probably the most common reason, is that the right side of the brain, when people have dementia, it's the left side and the front of the brain that starts to deteriorate first. And the right side of the brain is the part of the brain that deteriorates last. And so that's where we remember that we're adults and this is what we, you know, we're in control of our lives. And so people typically, uh, they lose their short-term memory. And so they think that they already bathed or showered because there's someone who always stayed clean and bathed and showered regularly, which is in our cultural culture, very appropriate. You know, most people in our culture uh, bathe or shower pretty regularly. The other thing, secondly, they are, these are very private activities. Again, we are not comfortable typically with someone coming in and assisting or asking questions about our own hygiene, our cleanliness. It's not a comfortable topic for most families. Um, this is particularly true with people who um, are interacting with their parents because again, it's not something that most of us, I don't wanna necessarily help my dad or my mom with the shower. That's not a really comfortable you know, activity. People also don't smell themselves. They don't notice the soiled clothing because again, if you if if you have very remember people with dementia have very limited uh, range of vision. And so if you have very limited range of vision and you look down, you're probably not even going to be able to see your own clothing. And so people think they're clean and people think that they changed clothes and you can argue with them all day long and you're not going to get anywhere. Um, because people think they already have clean clothes on. Um, also, people don't want to be cold. And remember, as people age in general, dementia or no dementia, people, as they get older, tend to be colder, even in the summertime, but particularly in the wintertime. And so disrobing is a cold experience for a lot of people. It's not real comfortable, particularly when it is cold or when you feel cold. And so people just, you know, they want to kind of snuggle in their clothes and stay clothed. Um, another issue that families don't often understand is that, um, especially with showers, people start to become afraid of water because they, 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 the sensation of water falling on your face, if you can't see the source and you don't understand the source because you have limited vision, that's for many people kind of a frightening experience. And so it is very common for people to become very afraid of water, especially in their head and, and face region. And by the way, uh, it's not that people with dementia are, are children or like children, I'm not saying that at all. Um, people are adults and we have to treat them like adults, but you will also find this similar fear of water in small children sometimes, particularly under the age of three, you know, and that's where, bathing children um, can be, you know, you have to think about the head and the neck region because there's kind of this similar um, fear of water. Um, and also movement and mobility become very challenging. And so bathrooms um, are kind of tight places to get around anyway. <laughs> and now when people are having trouble getting around, there's um, particularly bathtubs. Uh, we do recommend if at all possible, walk-in showers for people. Um, and, and handheld um, devices where they can be in control of the water, not kind of coming on their head. Um, because um, bathtubs in particular, 
stepping in and out of bathtubs, sitting down, getting up from bathtubs um, is a place where many falls and accidents also happen. And in fact, one of the things that we absolutely recommend in a lot of families is getting grab bars put in all over the place, not just at the toilet, but also in the, in the shower region. So um, just some suggestions here. First of all, uh, think about how often people really need to shower or bathe for realistic health and safety concerns. And this is probably um, this is probably different by person, but it's also kind of thinking about, I always jokingly say, let's go back a hundred years, you know, and now we're in 2022. So let's go 1922. About how often do you think you would have showered or bathed? You know, in a typical, even in the United States of America, you know, you probably would have bathed maybe once a week, if that. Um, you know, it was not a, 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 as common a practice as it is now. Hygiene was definitely um, kind of a little bit different. Um, access to water was a little bit different. And I say that to say that this idea that people need to bathe or shower every single day is very cultural and it's cultural to today. And if you look at real health and safety, it's probably people can get away with not showering or bathing every single day. And with dementia, oftentimes, uh, this is a very helpful thing to think about because sometimes if you can get someone in the shower twice a week, you're doing great. So, and you have to be sometimes okay with that. Another uh, suggestion is just to prepare the space a little bit. Um, adding a shower chair and a handheld nozzle again so that people don't have that face. Now that's an adjustment and people aren't always used to those two things. So it takes a little bit of time to kind of get used to that if people have not been used to those. Um, it can be helpful to warm the towels or the washcloths and I generally recommend warming them in the dryer. But also warm the space. I always say, can you get the bathroom warm? You know, can you uh, you know, turn up the heat a little bit before showers or whatever, if, if the bathroom's cold or if they're cold, you know, can you put some fuzzy, really warm um, carpets on the, uh, you know, rugs, you got to be careful with throw rugs because they can also be a hazard. But if you, something sticks really well, get something that's really going to be warm to people's feet. Um, I always say, you know, that I live for the day when they have affordable towel warmers in every house or whatever, you know, in Finland, where it's freezing cold, you know, eight months of the year, they all have built-in towel warmers, even in the most humble of places. We really don't have that here, you know, and towel warmers are not something that most of us, you know, have uh, in our bathrooms. But um, it is really helpful to have towels and washcloths and clothes warm. And then sometimes people even um, turn the lights down a little bit or turn on calm music or music that people like. Uh, from their earlier years, you know, music is almost always helpful in terms of helping with people's moods. Um, if people have a history of hairstyling or grooming at a shop, one of the things I recommend is then if they've kind of done that, but maybe they've only done it once a month because it was pricey, if you can afford it, maybe have their hair done once a week. Also because Laying back and having your hair done is a very different sensory experience for a lot of people with dementia, as opposed to, again, the water coming forward, which can be scary. So sometimes just having an appointment with the salon or the barber to get a wash, a set or a trim, or, you know, even for men, sometimes this can be very, very helpful. Um, sometimes I say you have to get really creative and offering incentives like, hey, you know, once you get that shower taken, uh, oh, we're going to go out to lunch with so-and-so, but, you know, you got to, here's your clothes, you know, why don't you go in and get ready because we have to do this thing. So sometimes you can, you know, kind of offer incentives or put something in front, you know, so that people have that incentive. Um, there are uh, cleaning products, which are no rinse, uh, both hair and body products. And so in a pinch, it can be very helpful to um, buy these products and have them on hand um, that can help you because the no rinse um, products to clean the body, you know, you don't have to get that person wet. You still do have to be able to access their points, but sometimes you can, you know, um, use these products, particularly people who have lots of issues with water on their head and things. Um, 
the other trick I kind of sometimes mention is um, as much as possible have maybe different sets of very similar clothing. So when someone does go into the shower, one of the tricks you can, or I don't know if it's a trick, but you can exchange people's clothes, but it, they, when, you know, they may look and say, they may think they're the exact same clothes if they look similar. So I say, you know, think about how you can get people's clothes kind of into the washing machine. <laughs> Sometimes you have to be a little bit sneaky or tricky. And I've had families um, say, you know, so-and-so went out to lunch with our grandson and I went into the bedroom and got every possible thing I could to wash him and then put him back in the bedroom before the person even comes back and things like that. So to try not to argue with people about this or unsettle people, sometimes you have to get a little bit tricky and realize that, you know, if, if the goal is to get the clothes clean, really doesn't matter how you do it, even if they don't know that you do it. So. The next challenge that we're going to address is toileting. In general, as we age, there are um, issues that can come up with urinary incontinence and constipation. And um, this is a result of the body becoming a little less efficient um, as we age. And we joke in terms of, you know, table talk conversation um, among some older folks is talking about bladder and constipation issues, but it's, it's, a, it's a real issue. And um, folks with dementia are not exempt from this issue. Um, Many times um, people with, dement with dementia will develop extra challenges as they go through their journey with the disease. And the reason this is, is because of the brain damage and the body may not be getting the right the, the brain may not be connecting um, to the bodily signals that are being expressed. They may not be able to recognize the sense of urgency or that need to be able to um, respond appropriately and get to the restroom to go to the bathroom. Why does this happen? As we said, you know, sometimes it's the dementia, but it's also um, can be the result of, of medications. Um, on average, older adults are taking at least eight medications a day. Um, that in itself can um, cause some changes in our bowel and bladder system. Um, so um, people, with dementia may also not necessarily, we've talked about it in the past, but um, have the language, have the ability to say, you know, I need to, to go to the bathroom. I, there's something, something's happening. I need to go and be able to um, have the privacy of the bathroom to relieve myself. Um, they may start pacing. They may have other behaviors that as a caregiver, um, you become tuned into to recognize Ah, that's their signal. Um, again, Paula has said before, you know, um, an older adult is an older adult is an older adult. Um, and they, they do not become children, but some of the patterns that we may observe with young children who may not initially express, I have to go to the bathroom, but go into a corner or just get fidgety or, you know, Act, act in other ways that are indicators that they have to relieve themselves. Just be tuned in that um, someone with dementia may exhibit, exhibit similar behaviors that are their way of communicating that they have to relieve themselves. One thing that we know that can occur as one gets older is the increased incidence of urinary tract infections. Um, and they can be even more common with people that have dementia. The scary part is that urinary tract infections, just the way they impact the body, can result in exacerbating or creating, magnifying the behaviors, the dementia-like behaviors. And so we often alert caregivers to say, if you're noticing um, a significant change in behavior in your loved one, make sure to check with your family doctor and rule out that there's not a urinary tract infection. If there is, they can treat it. And oftentimes you'll see that the behaviors um, that you were observing that seemed out of sync will dissipate. Um, 
Yes. So how do we um, address this? One, by being tuned into our, the behaviors of our loved one. Um, you don't want to deny people um, fluids. In fact, you want to encourage them to have fluid and fiber throughout the day to help their bodily systems function at their optimal. Um, and um, we don't ever want to risk um, dehydrating somebody. A lot of times people are, oh, I'm not going to give any fluids after you know, a certain time, um, you know, be careful in making those decisions because you don't want it to result in dehydration, which creates its own set of issues. Um, if you think that there is something um, that might be beneficial if they're not relieving their bowels and you're adding fiber and that doesn't seem to work, talk to your healthcare provider. There may be some um, things that can be added to their diet that will help um, or medications that might you know, help them become more re regular. Uh, in during the course of the day, remind people to use the bathroom on a regular schedule um, as they may not be able to give themselves those own reminders. And it may be pairing with, I'm going to go use the restroom. Why don't you come and you'll use it after I'm done? Um, you know, rather than um, making it anything punitive, just make it a part of your regular day. Uh, the other thing to recognize, and I think that this is so hard, um, nobody wants to have an accident um, and to be sensitive to that. And, and even though it may result in your having to do more in terms of cleanup or alter you know, your schedule at the moment, um, know that it's not intentional um, and to uh, maintain as best as possible, um, the individual's dignity and respect. Um, there are lots of different products out there, um, you know, to help um, people, whether it is um, Depends, or there are different name brands um, that people can wear ongoing. There are things that you can put on the mattress, on your couch, um, in the event that somebody does have an accident so as to um, protect the furniture or the mattress. Um, we always want to uh, caution people in terms of not referring to products with childlike names like, you know, um, diapers, because that can be demeaning. And um, though somebody may have dementia, they still know that they're an adult. And that's important to, um, again, use language that maintains their dignity and respect. So another challenge that families are sometimes facing is the sleep-wake cycle, that's what we call it. But people with dementia often struggle with maintaining um, a kind of a healthy sleep-wake cycle. Either they sleep during the day and are up at night, which is common, or they're up and down all night. And sometimes they're wandering the house, uh, people in the house are trying to sleep. Also in wandering the house, they may get food out, leave food out, they may be able to get outside. You know, there's just all sorts of potential safety concerns there as people are wandering. So, um, and, and people with dementia often struggle with evenings as well. We um, sometimes, uh, we will hear the term sundowner syndrome. Um, it is very, very common for people to be a little bit more confused later in the afternoon and certainly have more delusions and hallucinations at that point. Um, and part of that has to do, of course, with the brain being a little bit more tired. Part of it has to do with just the, the shadows and just the evening, you know, um, the show, The Twilight Zone, you know, is the, the time between dark and light. And, you know, there's all sorts of uh, cultural, you know, discussion about this particular point in time. But it is true that people certainly struggle more when their brains are struggling during this time. And so the problem, of course, is that care partners or caregivers end up exhausted because uh, you may, you know, be up and down a lot at night. And unlike the person who maybe can sit in their chair and doze in the afternoon, you have things to do. <laughs> and so you're, you know, you may be just exhausted. So just some suggestions we had. First of all, um, 
if you can possibly get people up and moving as during the day as much as possible, um, one of the patterns we've noticed with people is they are oftentimes sitting in the chair and dozing a lot or the television is on, you know, and it's not to say that people don't from time to time need naps, especially in the afternoon, they may need something, you know, kind of a little bit of rest. But also, um, they, this pattern of kind of sitting and dozing all day, the problem is then, of course, their body thinks that it's been nighttime because their body's not getting the correct signals. And then at night, that's when they're up. So um, as much as you can get people moving, I mean, honestly, even if it's just um, feeding the cat, uh, playing with the cat, uh, you know, it doesn't necessarily need to be some sort of enforced exercise or even though walks and things like that are really helpful, but, um, but getting, giving people excuses also, to asking them to fold laundry, asking them to, 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 to any excuse to move is a good excuse. And in fact, the more people move during the day, the better their brains are gonna to tend to function also. And that's also true for us, you know, in general, the more we move, the more the more exercise also our brain is getting. Now you can also talk to your doctor, particularly if people are wandering a lot at night or experience a lot of sleeplessness and they're active during the day or they're moving during the day, but then they also have this kind of sleeplessness that can sometimes be part of the dementia process. There are some very mild medications that can help people um, a lot of the over-the-counter sleep medications or the sleep medications that are being advertised all over, you know, that are, you know, uh, connected to Tylenol or Advil or all these kind of sleep products, um, I would not recommend uh, just going and buying those products and using them with people who have dementia. I think this is one of those areas where caution is absolutely appropriate because some of those medications, in fact, probably most of those medications contain products that really someone with dementia should not be taking. Um, the big one is Benadryl, and that's a medicine which uh, kind of can stay in the body a little bit too long and can cause all sorts of additional confusion. So I would say talk to your doctor because there are products that the body can tolerate maybe a little bit better, but most of them are prescription products. Um, also pay attention to the environment in the evenings. Um, lots of shadows outside, you know, are there lots of shadows coming in from the street? Do you have street lights near your house that are kind of shining in? Um, is there a lot of outside stimulation? And that can even be television. Sometimes evening television shows can cause people to be very unsettled because they don't, they hear, for example, the evening news I almost, I recommend that people almost never watch it <laughs> because the images that are shown in the news, especially of things around the world, you know, even an explosion that happened halfway around the world can cause people to be unsettled. And the interesting thing about that is that because people have short-term memory loss, they don't remember what image made them unsettled, but they are still unsettled from the image because that's on the right side of the brain. So um, sometimes noise is a problem. I remember I was working with a family a few years ago and the wife was convinced she had dementia. She had actually Alzheimer's disease. She was convinced that there were people dancing in the backyard and the husband kept saying, there are no people, I mean, in the backyard. And remember that this is basically a delusion. It's believing something's happening that isn't. But he just got so frustrated because she, you know, she just was convinced and she thought they were going to come into the house and she was always nervous and she was pacing and, you know, so he finally um, moved kind of their evening activities to a different room in the house and that kind of settled the issue. And then one day um, he came in and he told me that he was vacuuming in the back room and it was like five o'clock in the afternoon and he noticed that they had all these wind chimes on their porch and the wind chimes were, were all doing this and they were creating shadows that were coming into that room. And he finally understood that she was misinterpreting that and it was causing her to have a lot of anxiety. So he said, you know, what I did was I just took the wind chimes down and I closed the curtain um, and end of the problem, right? So um, I just say that sometimes if you look and see what's happening in the environment, 
there can be things happening that are causing people to be unsettled, even though they can't tell you what it is. Um, calming familiar music. Um, remember the familiar part. Usually people like music that is familiar to them from their 20s and 30s. So you got to kind of look and see what music people, some people like country western, some people like big band, some music, some people like spirituals or folk music from their childhood, religious music, you know, what was, uh, what, what, are, what are, is music that is familiar. Old movies with familiar rhythms can be helpful. Uh, I was just working with a family last week where the guy absolutely loves to watch old Westerns with his grandson. That's a wonderful activity for him. And you say, wow, they're kind of violent. It's true, some of them are. But the rhythm is what he's remembering, right? Um, and as I say, generally modern TV is not very helpful unless you can find something that is somehow calming, but even modern, you know, modern comedy and modern news and modern shows are probably not going to be real helpful for people. Um, and then prioritize your own sleep. Pay attention to your sleep. Uh, it's really important to get sleep. Even if the person is taking a nap in the afternoons and you have 27 things to do, maybe it's best for you to take lay down and take a nap also. Um, because, you know, your sleep is as important as their sleep is. And if you are exhausted, you will have a really hard time caring for them. The next challenge that we're going to talk about is eating and drinking. Um, one of the things that we know is that as the brain deteriorates with dementia, getting enough food and drink can be challenging. While some people, their appetite may increase with certain kinds of dementia, for the most part, appetites do diminish. They may forget to eat or drink. Um, they may already think they have, or they may forget that they already did. Um, so it can be a challenge um, to kind of navigate um, whether or not somebody, um, you know, helping them know that they need to keep nourished and keep um, fluids in without overdoing it or underdoing it. Uh, some things that do change, um, like, you know, our, our um, ability to uh, detect and, and either like or not like certain flavors or textures um, can can alter um, somebody's desire to eat what was once familiar to them and that they liked, um, depending on um, if they're having any uh, dental issues, if they have any sores in their mouth, if they have, you know, dent dentures uh, per se, um, anything that may physically be happening within their um, oral structure and even in terms of swallowing, um, those can all create some challenges for somebody with dementia. In addition to those physical challenges, there may be um, more issues with actually handling food and handling silverware, a fork and a knife. You know, they may pick up a, a piece of silverware, but not remember what to do with it. So oftentimes um, we might suggest that it's okay, one, if either you get some adaptive silverware, if it's a matter of their being able to grasp the handle or to be able to alter um, some of the options that you're given to them to eat and use more finger foods um, because that can make a big difference in terms of at least knowing that you're continuing to get proper nourishment into the individual. So one of the things that does happen as we get older um, and with dementia is that people crave sweet and cold food. Um, that means lots of cake and ice cream <laughs> um, and popsicles. Um, but it's, um, it's the balance that we have to be aware of. So understand that 
you know, sometimes to entice somebody to be able to jumpstart their appetite, you may take advantage of using um, a sweet food or a cold liquid um, to be able to jumpstart and get them to continue to eat. Um, always consult your physician or a nutritionist in, if there are concerns in terms of any deficiencies that might impact the individual if they're not you know, eating vegetables, if they've mixed those completely, how might you be able to um, address the vitamins that they might be missing from uh, not taking that type of food? Um, so take advantage of nutrition, nutritionists and your physician to find out if there are any supplements that would um, help balance the individual's diet. Um, as dementia progresses and the brain deteriorates, the sad thing, and um, but this is just the reality of the progression of the disease, is that chewing and swallowing can be really difficult. Just the ability to do those tasks may at some point be, on, be beyond their reach. Um, diets are sometimes have to be altered and softer textured foods or using thickening liquids. Um, to prevent choking or aspiration have to be added to um, the array of offerings um, to again, keep the person nourished, hydrated, but make adaptations as their body changes and their taste changes and their ability to take in food changes. So just some suggestions, if something is not working, and remember that uh, one of the things that happens with dementia is the brain is deteriorating with all of these diseases and situations that can cause, that can cause the, 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 the disorder we call dementia, right? It's not always Alzheimer's, it may be Lewy body dementia, frontal temporal dementia, vascular dementia. Um, but the person's brain is continuing to change. And so something that worked in October may not be working in January or February because the person's brain has continued to deteriorate. So we constantly see um, the person's needs and their challenges and their behaviors changing, okay? They may change slowly, but there is this continual deterioration. So if something is not working that you've done in the past, slow down back off and you may need to try it a different way. You may need to go back. Um, and a classic example of this, um, it, it's kind of a visual example is, um, I've come into the room before and someone has not recognized me or called me by a different name, but maybe they've been unsettled. Um, something you can do is go out, take your glasses off, mess your hair up and put another jacket on and come in <laughs> Because one of the things that happens is people, um, live very much in the moment. And so what might not be working right now under the current conditions, maybe there's background noise or there's something else going on, you know, 20 minutes later, it may work just fine. So slow down and back off, you know, try it a different way, try a different approach. These are always, you know, this is just advice that we oftentimes give. Um, think about limiting your verbal information. Um, I always say, think about how the Charlie Brown adults talk. Wah, 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 wah. So we try and keep, we try and talk to people and talk to people. And sometimes people just don't have the ability to understand what we're saying and we can overwhelm them with words. And so if you're trying to have someone, for example, zip up their jacket, it may be just as useful to show them, okay? or to show them, take the Kleenex and blow your own nose and show people or take the cup and drink yourself or get hand them a cup and drink yourself. So thinking about as many visual cues as you can work into an environment probably is better than telling people or, you know, or relying on language. Um, sending positive and friendly nonverbal cues. Again, if the person sees me even though I'm not talking angry, but if I look angry, they're going to assume I'm angry because they're going to rely a lot more on verbal, uh, on visual cues. So can you make yourself, even if you're irritated, friendly? And, you know, you want to go in the other room and 
yell and scream or whatever, that's fine. But as much as possible to the person, um, be uh, positive, friendly, calm. This is all going to be helpful. Uh, people sometimes feel hurried and rushed. And, you know, sometimes people take so much longer to do things that we can hurry and rush them because we also also are, you know, if you have to get someone to the doctor by a certain time, it can be super frustrating if it takes them 15 minutes to get their jacket on, you know, so I get it. But as much as you can take time to connect, see where they're at. Um, and then if you're going to have people do something that requires instruction one step at a time. And again, we're used to, you know, people doing many things at the same time, maybe to get ready. And now the person can only handle one instruction at a time. Um, like I said, if you can model it, model what you want, gesture through something, point to something, use as many visual cues as you would like. The other little hint here is when people are trying to tell me something, but they're, they're, they just don't have the words and they're getting frustrated, I will say, show me. And I will have them take me and show me. Maybe they want a cup of water or they want, you know, a piece of chocolate or something. I'll say, show me, because sometimes they are struggling with the words. Um, and then the last um, idea here is to just really think about respecting people's personal and intimate space. In other words, always stop before we actually go in and start touching someone or assisting someone. Um, I would say that in general, one of the biggest issues that I find when I look into, you know, work with professional caregivers, nurses, aides, and healthcare professionals is that um, they kind of start touching people before they've given the person that opportunity to kind of get used to them and know what they're doing. Um, sometimes people are touching from the back and people don't even know what's going on because they don't have um, that vision, you know, that side vision or so really kind of think about people's space and be very, very careful about touching people before, you know, getting them comfortable with you and make sure they always know where, you know, what you're doing instead of trying to touch. Um, and, and mostly we're touching people to help people. We're trying to help them zip. We're trying to help them eat. We're trying to help them drink. Our goal for you is to really understand as much as possible what's happening with the person. Um, and this can be really, really challenging because you almost feel like you're an investigator sometimes. You know, what can be happening? Why are they thinking people are dancing in the backyard? Why are they scared right now? Why do they have anxiety? Why do they think I'm stealing from them? Get support so that you can both survive and thrive together. Um, the person can have, can continue to have a life that have moments of joy in it. It's just that it can be more difficult to find that place and develop that insight so that you also, both of you together can continue to have moments of joy in your day. You may have challenging moments in your day, but to also have that balance in your day. That's our goal for you. This program was brought to you as part of the National Family Caregiver Support Program. It is um, a program that is funded and operated by Area Agencies on Aging. It allows us to provide caregiver workshops and resource guides and information. Through this program, there is limited short-term funds designed to assist caregivers. Um, and it varies by each county, but we will show you our county um, focal entities on our next slide. But just know that through the National Family Caregiver Support Program, services include information and assistance, counseling, respite, which means a break, and other supplemental services, meaning that in every case, we're looking at what would help the individual caregiver. What do they need? Um, and this program is funded from a national level through the Older Americans Act.
I mentioned our county partner agencies. As the Area Agency on Aging here in Columbus, we serve Franklin County and the surrounding counties all listed here. And in each county, there is what we sometimes refer to as a focal agency that receives some funding from us, but also is a key partner in addressing the needs of older adults and supporting family caregivers. So you can see the names of each of these um, county partners on this slide. Lynn also mentioned that the Area Agency on Aging puts out some helpful guides. These are also, these are up on our website in the resource section and you can download the PDF of them or we are always happy to send you a hard copy if you'd like, you just have to let us know. So just to say, I won't go through every single one of these, but um, in the top corner, there's the older adult resource guide, which is kind of like a, a phone book that has lots of different resources throughout our eight county area for um, older adults and their families. The second guide, the caregiver toolbox is kind of a how-to guide. It's kind of a book. It's not, doesn't have as many resources listed. It's just kind of a, how to do, you know, and there's a section in there on um, caring for a person with dementia. So there are many different kinds of sections in there. And then the other guides that we have are mostly resources um, on particular topics. So maybe you don't need the whole big resource guide, but you just need to know about long-term care and hospice, or you need to know about how to hire in-home care. Uh, so we have different topical guides that are available uh, through our area agency on aging. Again, maybe you only need transportation. We have a transportation guide. So we have these smaller topical guides. We thank you for joining us for this program. We hope you find it informative. Please know that you can always reach out to us at the number listed on the screen, 614-645-7250, or go to our website, www.coaa.org, where you will find the guides um, that Paula just referenced, along with handouts that correspond with this workshop that we just provided to you. Um, we are here. You have a question, um, we'll try and give you the answer. And if we don't know the answer, we're more than happy to do the research to try and find it for you. Um, so we thank you for your attendance. Thank you very much.